Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, uh, Zoom online uh, uh, seminar. And uh, I know this is a huge privilege that uh, we have uh, Greg Ogden and uh, Ralph uh, tonight with us. And I know some of you are a little bit uh, 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 sometimes challenged with the online meetings and uh, uh, some people, some leaders, some pastors told me, Samuel, we are a little bit tired from Zoom, <laughs> but uh, uh, they are here and I'm so happy that they are here. And we are recording uh, this uh, session because we have a high demand of the people who couldn't be tonight in live, but they would like to watch that and uh, watch this presentation and lecture. We will put that on a YouTube that we can uh, use that uh, uh, and uh, we will send to other people and to you as well. Uh, my name is Samuel uh, Petrovsky. I'm the National uh, Director of uh, IFS Serbia. And this event is organized together in partnership with uh, IFS Albania. Uh, with uh, And I'm so happy that uh, National Director of Albania and IFS, Zefi Nikola, is here. He will uh, finish with a, with a prayer and the challenge uh, on the end. And I would like to explain the dynamic of uh, tonight's uh, uh, event. Uh, we will... Um, uh, uh, the topic is um, learn to way to make disciples who makes disciples, and we are we have this great commission that Jesus gave us. But we realize that sometimes our churches and organizations are not making disciples, and that we have a crisis of creating uh, disciples who are intentionally uh, uh, spending time and making other Christ disciples, uh, younger generation around themselves. And I think this is a great challenge, not only for Balkans, but also great challenge for the many, uh, many uh, organizations and churches all over the world. And we are very happy uh, here. Uh, 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 I will start now with a prayer and I will give the word to Greg and, uh, and, and Ralph, and then uh, there'll be some presentations and then later we'll be uh, we will divide uh, uh, all groups. We will create a couple small groups where we can discuss. And Steve uh, uh, from Niche from EU Serbia is technical coordinator for this event. And uh, uh, if you have any problem, you can uh, uh, ask Steve. Steve, you can raise your hand that people can see you. <laughs> and uh, and then on the end, when we finish discussion, Zefian uh, will finish with uh, uh, with the prayer and uh, and the message. We have uh, uh, we translated the discipleship essentials in two languages in Balkans, in Serbian, in Albanian. Uh, now it's starting uh, in Macedonian uh, language and a couple other languages. But uh, we will give uh, to everybody uh, in Serbia electronic version, but also you can buy a Serbian version of the uh, book. Uh, you can uh, send us email and Steve will put the email uh, where you can uh, order your own free online uh, uh, gift, uh, the book, and also you can get information how you can get a printed book as well. So uh, let's we start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm asking you that you can bless us, speak to our hearts, speak to our mind. Uh, Lord, we, I'm asking that you will uh, uh, use this session to inspire us and refresh us and motivate us that we can be people who loves people, who are leading people, and who are making disciples. And Lord, that we are praying that uh, that the Balkans will be famous in the future for disciple making movement in our churches and in our Christian organization, in our Christian student ministries. Lord, we are praying for this event uh, tonight. Be with us and, uh, and uh, use this event as a, as a new start for, for, for many good things that you have in front of us. I'm praying this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, Greg. Now I'm giving uh, uh, to you uh the open mic and you can uh, uh start and it will be good that you can maybe a little bit give introduction about yourself because there are few people who don't know you well especially from uh, serbia and uh, there are some from croatia as well and uh please uh, lead us and if i may say uh samuel just said the book will be available in serbian and albanian right now i put in the chat the email addresses where you can contact for both of those 
Thank you, Samuel. Uh, great to be with you. What a joy it is for me and for Ralph to be able to share this time with you. Thank you for t setting it aside and being a part of our gathering. Just a couple of words uh, about our format. Uh, so you're not surprised. We try to do short teachings and then interaction. In other words, so we'll do this a number of times throughout our time together. You're not going to have to listen to us uh, go for a half hour, 45 minutes. We'll do 10, 15 minutes at the most. And then we'll have, have you be in groups and interact. And, uh, and then also feel free to put any questions that you might have in the chat box uh, so that we can stop periodically and pick up questions as we go. Uh, so instead of saving all of them to the end, for example, we'll, we'll pick up questions as we move from one topic to the next, we'll uh, and pick up some questions. So with that, uh, just some brief words about myself uh, so you understand who this is. You can see that I have uh, a much better looking wife than I am. Uh, so uh, we um, are, I, I'm a retired pastor after 38 years of pastoral ministry. Uh, I like to say I'm a redeployed pastor. Uh, I get to do the things I love to do the most, and that is talk about disciple making and teach people to do it and practice it, of course, myself. And married uh, to 53, for 53 years to that lovely lady uh, on my left. and. Uh, actually, tomorrow will be 53. I'm actually only 52 years and 364 days of marriage right now. So uh, September 6th is our anniversary. And uh, we have one daughter and uh, two grandchildren. And uh, they look like this and uh, live in a city, Salt Lake City. My daughter's a, a, a doctor. So uh, we're out um, teaching people uh, an approach uh, to making, reproducing disciples of Christ. That's what's a passion of our heart and our ministry. Ralph, share a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been a, I was a pastor, also retired pastor for 32 years in Southern California. I spent before that 14 years on Campus Crusade staff, and uh, our church in Southern California began to use Dr. Gregg's material uh, in the last five years of my stay there, and it transformed our church. We saw some amazing things happen, and when I retired, Greg and I joined forces, and we formed GDI, Global Discipleship Initiative, uh, as he said, with the intent of training pastors uh, and church leaders around the world in making disciples who make disciples. I'm married as well. I uh, have a, a wife, two uh, children, four or six grandchildren, um, and I live in Washington State in the northwest corner of the United States, 20 minutes south of the Canadian border. Very good. Thank you, Ralph. Um, so, uh, this is the organization that we formed, if you can see it, GDI, Global Discipleship Initiative, and uh, you can see our website there, globaldi.org, you can find, uh, and then perhaps the YouTube channel where you can see a lot of videos um, that have been made, training videos, um, videos that introduce each chapter of Discipleship Essentials, if you're working through that as a discipleship material. So with that, I'll move on. Let's uh, jump right in and perhaps start by stating the obvious uh, in terms of the ministry that Jesus has given us. But I think I like to go back over this uh, because you can see uh, in Matthew 28 verses actually 16 uh, through 20, uh, the context in which Jesus issues his great commission tells us what our life is to be all about, what our ministry is to be all about. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain uh, to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Uh, I, I just try to visualize that scene with Jesus in his resurrected state, probably still bearing on his body, the wounds in his hands and in his side, uh, standing before the disciples. Um, and uh, I can't imagine that the Great Commission was not birthed in worship, that they must have fallen down uh, to their knees, especially after he says this, what he says in verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I always like to say, anytime you read that statement, you should pause and say, Whew, what did he say? Uh, did those words come out of a human being's mouth. Uh, how much authority is that? Well, uh, it's all-encompassing 
all of the, the created world over which he reigns. There was a uh, Dutch theologian by the name of Abraham Kuyper says that there's not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is Lord over all, does not exclaim, mine. Uh, this is all his. And we are just here to carry out his will and purpose. And what is that? Uh, going, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And uh, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So I'd just like to underscore that in the structure of the Greek language here in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, there is one single imperative, one single command, one single this you must do, uh, and that is make disciples of Jesus of all nations. And so uh, stay focused on that, zero in on that. I remember when this first became clear to me, and above all things, it was like Jesus saying, don't take your eyes off of this, spend the rest of your life fulfilling this particular uh, command that I am giving you. And then he gives us what are called three participles, and uh, that's what we call them in the English language, three verbal adjectives that give us a profile of what a disciple is. And, um, and so it looks like this, going to all nations. It's all about sharing the good news and evangelism. Disciples are people who move out. They move towards other people. They have that impelling spirit. Uh, baptized in the name and the life of the three-person God. I like to remind us that this is not just a formula of baptism, but it has to do with our identity. We are being included into the beloved community of the eternal community of the God who is three persons and he's opened up that circle and drawn us in and we are included in that love relationship. And then he says, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, the lifelong process uh, to dine to self while Christ comes alive in us. Um, how long will it take to obey all that Jesus has commanded us? Uh, it will take the rest of our life. Um, this is our vocation. Uh, this is the what we are to live for in obedience uh, to Christ. So that's the kind of just the reminder of of what this is all about. <clears throat> I like the way C.S. Lewis uh, puts it uh, in his statement in Mere Christianity. Excuse me. Um, I get this moved up here. There we go. The church exists for no other purpose but to draw people into Christ to make them little Christ. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It's even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. I'd just like to remind us that we get to be a part of any eternal vocation. Now, we get to be a part of helping people um, now and into forever uh, is a part of fulfilling the, the Great Commission. And it's the reason that the universe exists to become followers of Christ, to make little Christ, and help people grow up in the faith, and then also then help people reproduce themselves into the lives of others. So how are we doing at that? Um, so that's the, that's the question. Now we've established what we are to be about. Uh, how, how, how will we evaluate that? So Ralph, I'm going to throw it to you and uh, have you take over here and, and uh, take us into the, kind of this first self-assessment. Okay. Um, the, as I began to consider my role as a pastor, um, I had someone ask me a question. What was Jesus's last command? Well, that was obvious. We just quoted it a moment ago, and I could quote it, and I think most pastors in America could quote it for you, and they would immediately recognize the Great Commission being referenced. But the second question was, can you name Jesus's disciples? Oh, well, yeah, I could name most of them, I think, and of course, pastors here in the United States, they would be able to do that or at least a, a good number of them. But then the third question is what stunned me. They asked the question, can you name your disciples? 
there was this awkward silence because I didn't know how to answer that question. Well, okay, I preach on Sunday morning, and sure, there are people who are being discipled in some manner uh, in a uh, in a public assembly like that. But that's not what Jesus. That's not the method that Jesus used, and I wasn't using Jesus's method to disciple anyone at the time. Uh, and I began to be convicted about that. Uh, the approach to making disciples who make disciples. We use Jesus's method as well as giving them his message. So we began to change some things that we were doing. I began to change some things that I was doing in that process and began to intentionally make disciples who would make disciples. Um, This, uh, the point of the whole session this morning is about teaching us or tonight for you uh, is to teach uh, this Emphasis on making disciples who make disciples. I went to a uh, church planting seminar some years ago in Southern California, and I sat for an hour and a half as they talked about planting churches. And they finally got down to a bullet point late in the presentation where they said, make disciples. And I was very disturbed during that time. I could sense my temperature going up as I listened to them talking about raising money and putting teams together and all of these things, but never mentioning disciple making. Uh, I have come to realize that making disciples is the primary purpose of the church. And that's where we start, not where we, uh, not something we add later on. So making disciples who make disciples. Um, Greg, where did you want me to go from here? I'm sorry. Oh, I'll, I'll pick it up. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so um, we have a, an opening kind of conversation we like to have um, together. And this is kind of a case study to evaluate how, how are we doing at making disciples? How do we feel about being disciple makers ourselves? So I pose this kind of uh, scenario. Uh, pastor, leader approaches a, a fellow believer. And I, I want to introduce you to Joe or Jane. Uh, he, he or she is a new convert and has just come to know Christ. I want you to walk alongside him or her, stay with him, uh, help him to become a mature follower of Christ. And by the way, your job is not done until Joe has assumed responsibility and has been able to equip others to do the same. So what, what if you, let's personalize this, um, somebody came and approached you, maybe your uh, IFES leader, and said, ah, you know, we've got a new believer um, that's come to our, our fellowship, and we really need to help this person uh, get grounded in the faith, become mature, and the part of the maturity process is helping them do the same for others. Um, how would you feel about taking on that responsibility to helping a other mature person become mature in Christ? And so in our first discussion time here, uh, here's the the question we want to do. Steve is going to break us into groups of three uh, and have conversations with her. You only have five minutes. And here are your questions. If you receive this assignment to disciple another to maturity and reproduction, multiplication, uh, do you think you could do it? Why or why not? What do you think it would take to be a, a good discipler of others? So we're encouraging you to take a picture of the screen, realizing that once you get into groups, you will not be able to see this slide uh, in front of you. So if you have your phones handy, uh, pull them out quickly and take a picture of the screen uh, so that you have a, uh, a remembrance of what it is you're being asked to talk about. And so when you come together with your group of three, uh, this is all going to be randomly selected. So you probably may not know the persons that you're going to be with. Uh, Give each other your name and your location and then jump right into this discussion. Because after five minutes, Steve is going to pull you out of those groups and come back on on the screen again. So Steve, let me turn it over to you. And uh, uh, hopefully people know what your assignment is now. You've got the screen uh, picture taken, and you, you can uh, go off into your groups. We'll do this a number of times. I'm going to wait one more second. If you have not taken a picture of this question, please do it now, and I'll send you into your groups. See you in five minutes.
Seems that some of you have not clicked to join the group. If you would click on the option to join your group, I know there are people out there in groups all alone. <laughs> Please join them. They're lonely. They are lonely. Makes it a little <clears throat> awkward. We get used to doing this before we're done. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I will move a couple people so they're not alone. Oh, okay. Can you see? Yeah, you can see where they are. are I will move. So in one minute, it says breakout rooms will be closed. Okay. Okay. Are we back? Another 10 seconds. 10 seconds, okay. And then give a few more seconds. Sometimes it takes because of internet to get back in here. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give me the high sign. I think everyone's here. Okay. Welcome back from your discussions. I hope that uh, went well. Um, that you had a chance to kind of evaluate hmm, how well equipped do I think I am uh, to disciple another person to help them grow in their faith and uh, become a well-grounded person in Christ and then uh, to disciple others. And so that's kind of our first evaluative um question uh, to be able to do some self-assessment. Uh, some of you are probably very experienced at this. Others of you may, mm, okay, I guess I could use some help and wondering what it would take uh, to do that. Well, let's hope I can give you some help. And uh, if I were to use one word to describe the state of discipleship, at least in the American church, which is what I know the best, uh, is it's very superficial. Um, we are very, are very consumer-oriented church in America. We come to get rather than to give. We come to receive from what the pastor can give to us, and then um, we leave and uh, you know sometimes live very separate lives uh, from our own faith. So a big question is how? How do we m help people become fully devoted followers of Christ? Um, what, is there a way, a means? Well, let's take a look. Uh, at uh, a biblical foundation. The teaching tool that we use uh, at GDI is what you see on the screen. Uh, you can see on the right side of the screen, what's a successful disciple-making journey look like? Well, it's disciples who make disciples. So that's the goal. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so we would love to see churches and ministries and student ministries in particular uh, be disciple-making ministries. Well, what are the components for a successful journey? Well, you need a vehicle, a car, uh, and that's the relational environment. Uh, you'll hear about that in a moment. We'll use the term microgroups quite a bit uh, during this presentation. Every car needs a driver, so you have to have somebody that can help you get to the destination by behind, be, being behind the wheel of the car. And then you need a map or a GPS, a reproducible process. Uh, and this is the discipleship curriculum. So you need what's the environment that we need to be in, uh, what's the nature of leadership uh, in a discipleship group, and what's some material that you can use for process. So you're, you've got the overview of where we're going now uh, with our, our, our time together. So let's look at that biblical model of disciple making. If you have Bibles with you, uh, please grab your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 6. Verses 12 and 13, and which is what I will do right now myself. I think I've got it pretty well memorized, but just to check my own memory. Um, Luke uh, 6, 12 and 13. 
uh, we're approximately, um, you know, six months or thereabouts into Jesus' public ministry at this point in the Gospel of Luke. And it says, uh, in these days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, and then their names uh, are given in the next few verses. So um, we obviously see that Jesus has a larger group of people following him uh, than the twelve at this point. And Jesus comes to a very strategic moment in his ministry. And Luke is sort of signaling how important it is, um, this event. But what's going to take place the next day? Because he says that Jesus spent all night in prayer. And I like to think about, gosh, if I could have been there, uh, eavesdropping on the prayer that the Father was receiving from the Son, what was Jesus interacting with, with, with the Father? What was he talking to the Father about that night? And I sort of speculate that uh, uh, Jesus might have been talking to the Father, maybe humorously. Uh, Peter, you really want me to have Peter as one of my disciples? Do you know what kind of person he is like to be around? Um, well, probably not. Um, my guess is that he's already knows who it is he's going to call to follow him. And he's spending the night in prayer for each one of them by name, praying for what they will become under his formative influence. Be and then secondly, what were some of the strategic reasons? Why was this important for Jesus to do? What was he trying to accomplish uh, with the efforts here the, to uh, give himself in this fashion? And well, very important strategic reasons, right? Uh, you cannot make disciples in crowds. Let me say that again. You cannot make disciples in crowds. <laughs> you have to come out of the crowd into relationship with Jesus and other disciples to become a fully devoted follower of Christ. Jesus did a lot of speaking to the crowds. No question about it. In fact, if you go on just beyond this text uh, that I've just read, you will see that Jesus was at a very popular moment in his ministry. The crowds were flocking to him. Why not just get the crowds bigger and bigger? Why not just create a mass movement and take over everything? <laughs> um, well, uh, Jesus knew that the crowds could be with him one moment and gone the next. Um, that the people are very fickle. Uh, it requires no commitment to be in a crowd. Just as it requires no commitment to sit in an audience in worship on a Sunday morning. Um, you, you're there. It took that commitment, I guess, to show up. But uh, you don't know the tilt of somebody's hearts. It's only in personal relationship that people are formed. So Jesus needed the teaching moments uh, when he was with his disciples. When uh, James and John slip up beside him and say, when you come into your kingdom, can we sit on your right and left hand? <laughs> uh, that became a teachable moment in Jesus' ministry, saying, guys, you really have no idea what you are asking. And uh, he had to teach them about what true greatness was all about. Because what happened when the other ten heard about what James and John were trying to do, slip in uh, on the king in the kingdom ahead of everybody else, uh, they were indignant. They were upset. And Jesus teaches them about servanthood. Those who will be the greatest will be the servants of all. That he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, you can't teach those kinds of things in crowds. It, it's only in personal relationships um, that it formed. And the ultimate goal, we know, of Jesus' ministry was to reserve the, now we know, 11 initially, uh, that uh, Jesus uh, had. And we get to the ultimate end of his ministry in Luke, or excuse me, in John chapter 17, uh, where Jesus is praying for his disciples. And he makes this really interesting statement in John 17, verse 4. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, he says. I read that thinking, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. Now, what was the ultimate work that we know that Jesus came to do? That was to go to the cross 
and bear the guilt and shame of our sin upon himself on the cross. But now Jesus says, I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. In fact, it's that same word, accomplished there, is the word that Jesus uses on the cross when he says, it is finished. He's completed. But so important was the preservation of these apostles that that was a foundational work that he did. He was ensuring that his ministry would go on by making sure he had invested in a few and built them up uh, for that, that ministry. So his ultimate goal here, his strategic reason was he knew that disciples were only made in personal relationship. Discipling is an intentional, personal relationship. And this is what we are taught. So disciples cannot be mass produced. Um, I, I love this statement from this classic book by A.D. Bruce called The Training of the Twelve. He says, this careful, painstaking education of the disciples secured the teacher's influence on this world should be permanent, that his kingdom should be founded on the rock of deep and indestructible convictions in the minds of a few, not on the shifting sands of superficial impressions in the minds of the many. Wow. Not on the sands of superficial impressions in the minds of the many. I remember I just said the state of discipleship, at least in the American church, is superficiality. Um, and Jesus spent his time building up a core who would carry on his ministry after he was gone. And we know that um, all of those disciples, except one, uh, went to their death as martyrs, uh, ready to carry on that ministry. Uh, it was there. So prioritizing individual personal investment. Um, what are the causes of superficiality? Uh, well, we've reduced disciple-making to programs. Uh, the, uh, we, have dis we have discipleship classes. We have, um, we have uh, ways of transferring information. We'll talk about this a little bit more, uh, more later. And I, we have diverted our leaders from equipping to preaching, caregiving, and administration, what I call the dependency model ministry. Uh, we all probably know uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, which I think is one of the few passages of scriptures that gives us a definition of the role that apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are to have to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. And what has happened uh, primarily is that we have diverted our leaders from their equipping role, from the equipping ministry that they are, are to have. And uh, that they no longer uh, perform that kind of role, but uh, they are creating a dependency. So, uh, so much of our disciple making is focused upon preaching. Um, and again, we'll look at that under the context of of uh, programs. Can you make disciples by preaching the groups of people? Well, you can certainly uh, invoke uh, some conviction that you need to grow as a disciple, but disciple making cannot happen by sitting in an audience, in a crowd. Uh, oftentimes the relationship that we have developed between pastors and people is one of caregiving. Um, the emotional contract that uh, is there between pastor and people is that pastor if something goes wrong in my life goes south in my life uh, and in uh, a grief or loss uh, I'm in the illness in the hospital uh, something has happened in my family situation pastor I, I expect you to be there to take care of me in that time of need um, and uh, what we're aiming for is the kind of mutual ministry uh, that uh, would be very helpful to have. Ralph, I'm going to turn to you. I want you to tell the story of your elder at this point in time that was ill, and, uh, and you're going to visit him in the hospital. This was an amazing discovery, Greg, because I, I didn't realize this was happening, but we had been in our, involved in disciple making for about two and a half years by this time. It had gone down into the deep heart of our congregation, and I got a message uh, that morning that my chairman of my board of elders had had a heart event, and he was in the 
emergency care unit of St. John's Hospital in Camarillo, California. Uh, I went immediately to the hospital. I wanted to see him. I wanted to pray with him. But when I got there, the emergency room nurse would not allow me into the room. Uh, she said he left a list of people who could be who would be allowed in, and I wasn't on the list. I'm his pastor. He's the chairman of my board of elders. I said, may I see that list? And she graciously allowed me to see it. It was the members of his discipleship quad. They were the ones that were allowed to come see him. His senior pastor couldn't come see him, but his, his quad members could. And I realized in that moment, though I was disappointed that I couldn't see him, I realized that exactly what scripture has talked about was happening there. We had equipped the people to do the ministry and they were doing the ministry and he expected them to be the ones to come see him. Um, it was, I, I walked away disappointed, but my load had been lightened. And I began to notice from that point on that my load as a senior pastor in a large church had begun to lighten because other people were taking the responsibility for ministry. Amen. And you know, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul tells us we should be doing in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, equipping the saints who do the work of ministry, and then the body of Christ is built up, right? Uh, but what happens in today's church is we have the pastors and teachers who do the work of ministry rather than equipping the saints to do the work of ministry. And the expectation from people in our congregations is often that uh, it's the pastors who are to do ministry, not us. We are to be the receivers of the pastor's ministry, not the doers of ministry ourselves, because we have taken that responsibility away from the people of God and given it uh, to, to the ministry. Uh, I like to say we oftentimes set up a spectator-performer relationship. If the primary event in our churches uh, is the Sunday morning preaching, um, then we are sitting there in rows, and the performer is the pastor. We are spectators. They're sitting ready to evaluate how the pastor is doing. <laughs> and uh, I know in our, our churches, we have this kind of shake the hand of the pastor after worship on Sunday morning, and people have to walk by and give you an evaluation of how your sermon was that day, uh, or how the worship experience was. And it's as if uh, I'm, here to, I'm here to evaluate, and you're there to perform. One Sunday morning, I was uh, doing that. I was shaking the hands of people as they were walking out of the church on Sunday morning. And uh, a woman came by, and she made it the comment. She said about my preaching, you know, you're getting better. <laughs> and uh, I didn't laugh so much at that time, but uh, I thought, Better than what? <laughs> Better than what kind of preacher I had I had been, and uh, gave me that evaluative comment. Well, so we have set up uh, systems in our own ministries where uh, we have not sh moved the responsibility onto the people of God and not equipped them uh, to be able to be disciple makers, uh, because that's that's what our pastors, that's what our staff does. They are the disciple makers. We're we're not able to do that kind of thing. And so, and the other, I, this is all about causes of superficiality. So programs, which we'll mention in a moment, uh, diverting our leadership away from equipping. And then, frankly, most people have not had an intentional, personal disciple-making relationship. Um, yeah, have, how have you been uh, formed in your disciple-making? Well, we'll talk about that uh, here in a moment. So... Um, Leroy Imes, in a cl classic book on d d disciple making, The Lost Art of Disciple Making, written back in the 1970s, says disciples cannot be mass produced. We cannot drop people into a program and see disciples emerge at the end of a production line. It takes time to make disciples, it takes individual personal attention. So uh, we're going to now, uh, and Steve is going to. Uh, have you go back there and this is a little bit more personal um, how will you personally help to become a disciple so in your groups got a little bit more time this time because it's more personal sharing share with each other how you were personally assisted in your initial growth in Christ was there a person or a group that was significant in that and then secondly what does Christ's model of personal investment with his disciples teach us about how we grow as disciples and disciple makers. How can we emulate uh, the model that Jesus uh, 
showed us in the Gospels in terms of his investment in a few, investment in the, in the 12. So again, take a picture here of, of what's on the screen. Um, do some personal sharing of, of how you were assisted in your growth in Christ. And some of you may say, like me, if I were to share you with my own story, when I first came to Christ, I got no help at all. Uh, I came to Christ at a church retreat weekend, came back to the church, uh, I filled out a decision card, and I heard from absolutely nobody about what to do with this new faith. I was a very young 12, 13 year old at the time and had no clue as to how I could grow into this wonderful new experience of the love of God that I had had. So maybe some of you have had that kind of experience as well. So uh, Steve, why don't you get us ready to go off uh, into our groups again, take about seven minutes, and then we'll come back together. See you in seven minutes. If you will click on the uh, button to go to your groups. Okay, I hope everybody's back. I think some, most of you probably are. We're going to move into a critical component of this whole methodology right now. When I was a senior pastor in Southern California, and we were looking for some way to do disciple making, and when I began to realize that what I've been doing for 25 years as a pastor, just what I call dictation method, uh, wasn't working that well in helping people really understand uh, that the components of the Christian life. And they just weren't getting it. Uh, I was preaching my heart out and it wasn't coming through. But uh, when I read Dr. Uh, Greg's material, uh, he suggested a relational environment, a micro group, a gender specific groups of four. Uh, and so we tried an experiment. We did it. We put uh, we I got a group. Uh, a couple of my staff members got a group. We tried we do an experiment. We put them in these uh, micro groups and use the material, the curriculum that Dr. Greg had put together and see what would happen. And what we discovered was amazing because people began to really understand the material. Uh, they weren't just sitting in an auditorium listening to me speak. They were going home with their Bibles and doing their homework. Uh, interacting, the Holy Spirit leading them. And we always say that these, these groups don't have a teacher except the Holy Spirit. He's the teacher in a micro group. Um, there may be a leader who kind of puts it together and coordinates the uh, gathering, but the, the teacher is the Holy Spirit and the text is the Bible. And so each person in the micro group does their homework, comes back to the, to the group with their homework done, and they are participants. In other words, they're not one teacher, they're four teachers in a sense. Everybody's teaching each other. We're learning from one another. And it's a very dynamic learning environment. And of course, anybody knows who's been a teacher very much that the teacher is the one who learns the most, much more than the students learn because you do all the preparation and you come and articulate it. But in this case, everybody's articulating it. And so they're all learning in a, a much greater depth. This relational environment that we discovered is, uh, is uh, Dr. Greg, likes to call it the hot house of, of growth. Uh, growth begins to take place at, at a much more accelerated rate. Uh, and the reason is because each person is encouraged to dig into scripture and discover these truths for themselves. Each person comes with new discoveries to add to the group. They're excited to share what they've learned and what the Holy Spirit has taught them during the week. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible has been their text. And so all of a sudden, these guys are being spending time in God's word, unlike probably they've ever done in their lives. Uh, they're, they're spending time digging in God's word, looking for answers. And so no one carries the whole responsibility for teaching in this group. Everybody's teaching one another. And we'll talk about that when we get more into the intentional leader uh uh, discussion, but uh, everybody is, is is the teacher. Everybody's sharing stuff. They discover truth more easily now, and it's remembered because now they're articulating that truth. Um, the truth is kind of defined. You wonder, well, aren't they going to come up with uh, errant doctrine somehow? Well, the group is sort of self-correcting when the, everybody's involved. Uh, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit is able to guide them into truth. Uh, they share these. It, 
uh, sharing these truths like this, it builds a bond between them. And you find that this bond that begins to uh, develop in the group between the members is a, a, a relational part of their life that becomes preeminent. I mean, these guys are coming back to me saying, this is a highlight of my week when I get together with you guys. And I'm thinking, you know, how can this be? But uh, that's what's happening. And this bond is, is uh, being built between the members of the group. They start going on vacation together. They start golfing together. They start doing things together, sharing life together, because we end every session praying for each other's needs. And there's high accountability. Uh, they're holding each other accountable for the covenant that we sign. And we'll talk about covenant later, but uh, they're, they're holding each other accountable and they're encouraging one another in their growth. Uh, the tight knit, knit, knit relationship uh, increases individual strength uh, as they're working through challenges in their own spiritual life and spiritual growth. Uh, they find a greater strength because they're sharing uh, strength with one another. Um, <clears throat> the collective accountability ensures then the application of what they're learning uh, in their life. Uh, they begin to apply these things and they hold each other accountable for that. Uh, discovery, as opposed to dictation, is the key uh, ingredient to what happens in this environmental or uh, in this relational environment. And that's the vehicle that takes us to the end of the journey, which is disciples making disciples. Um, <clears throat> they are learning this. And when they get to the end, of course, they have an answer book full of all of answers, not just their own answers, but the answers of everybody that was in their group. They've written them down. If you've got a better answer than I do, I write your answer down. So <clears throat> this micro group, this relational environment is a key component of this whole disciple making process. Now, you may find that different than what you've experienced before. I talked to a, uh, a man just yesterday who is doing discipleship one-on-one. -on -one. Nothing wrong with that, except uh, I think that this relational environment of four adds a, a, a much greater and richer environment for real growth to take place. Um, so, this, if this is new to you, doing any groups before, I, I think it's very well worth your uh, investment of doing an experiment and trying one of these small groups like this. Uh, I, I uh, retired in 19, uh, 2015. I retired after 32 years of pastoral experience and pastoral ministry. And I moved to this part of northern Washington, joined uh, with a church here, uh, a mega church that my son-in-law was on the pastoral staff, a church of about 2,500 people. And uh, I went to the senior pastor and I told him about what we'd done in Southern California with these microgroups and how this had enhanced our disciple making uh, so much. And I asked him for permission to start some of these groups in this new church that I was a part of. And he said, sure, that'd be great. Start some of those groups, but I want to be in your first group. I was a little shocked by that, but he was in my first group, and now he's done several groups of his own. And as a matter of fact, we have him on video. We want to try to show this video to you if we can. Pastor Bob Marvel, uh, pastor of lead pastor of Cornwall Church in Bellingham, Washington, and here's his comments on this relational environment. And I hope he's going to be speaking soon. <laughs> Greg, are we getting him to talk? Greg, you're muted. Rittenhouse, some of you know Ralph. We refer to him as the Quad Father around here. It was either going to be the Quad Father or Quadzilla. I decided to go with Quad Father. But I knew him years ago uh, because he was a senior pastor in Camarillo, California. His church there Sarah. was a host of the Leadership Summit, as was Quad. So we would meet each other and see each other uh, at these gatherings of host pastors. In addition to that, his son-in-law, Mike Ford, had come on our staff, and so I knew his daughter and his, his son-in-law. 
After he retired uh, from vocational, full-time vocational senior pastor ministry, he and his wife Jackie moved here to Bellingham and became a part of Cornwall Church. And one day I was asking his daughter Chrissy how her dad was doing with the retirement and not preaching every week and not having Easter services or Christmas Eve. And she said, well, he's really involved in this global discipleship thing and he's really excited about that. So when I ran into him, I said, Ralph, I'd like to hear about uh, your involvement and what you've got going. So we went and had coffee. And the, the reality is this, if you ever talk to Ralph, it won't take but about three or four sentences and somehow he has a way of turning the conversations toward Jesus and towards quads and discipleship. And so he was talking about the Global Discipleship Initiative, GDI, and what they were doing throughout the world and what these quads were. And I asked him if he was going to start one here in, in Bellingham or Whatcom County, and if so, could I be a part of it? And so I got to be a, a, one of his uh, members of his very first quad here in Whatcom County, and we signed on the dotted line that covenant on March 2nd, uh, 2016. Uh, the quad is a group of four individuals, and it uses this curriculum of discipleship uh, essentials. And there's the discipleship essentials is really a great, uh, a great foundational tool. It's almost like a systematic theology, great foundation for people who are new to the faith. It's actually a great reminder for people who have been walking with the Lord for a while. And one of the things I love about it is that it has the discipline of scripture memory, as well as uh, meeting together in accountability relationships over the course of maybe a year, year and a half. And uh, the thing that I think is so great about this is that the goal is not just to become a spiritual adult. I mean, I grew up hearing about baby Christians and young in their faith, and then the goal is for them to be mature and become a spiritual adult. The goal of the quads and this curriculum is to become a spiritual parent. And that the fact is now I'm not just mature, but I am reproducing myself in others and so the kind of the secret sauce behind all this is that in the covenant that you make from the very beginning it's this strong consideration that you will give to at the end of your discipleship a uh, year year and a half that you will then start your own quad and the great thing about that is the way that this has a multiplying effect built into it this is different than any other discipleship program i've been exposed to and i think this is one of the things that will make it most effective uh, for the future a year or so ago, I was on a sabbatical, and on that time away, uh, two things, I was walking with my wife across Spain, so I had a lot of time to think every single day. In that journey, I turned 55, which was kind of a, a milestone year, and in reflection on my life, 55, my ministry at Cornwall, the remaining chapter of being a senior pastor in the next 10 or 15 years if the Lord were to allow. How would I best utilize that time in this, this final run of my ministry? And one of the things that I came to the conclusion of is I want to just continue to point people to Jesus. But I thought about the kind of impact that I would have of preaching sermons that would be great, of leading the church that would be great, but of pouring my life into others. And so I have just started my third quad, and I cannot imagine over the next 10 or 15 years or however long I uh, have here on this earth and here at this church, and even beyond that into my retirement years, of ever not having a quad where I am pouring myself into other individuals, where we're learning and growing together, where I'm learning from, and where it's multiplying to allow other people uh, to be able to do that with groups as well. The kind of impact that that will have on our church, the kind of impact that that will have on our community, the kind of impact that that will have in the kingdom of God is far greater than can happen just in weekend services. So I'm very excited about quads. I'm very much involved with these. I believe in these. And I really am excited that you're considering being a part of one. And I think that you'll be blessed if you do. The amazing result of being in... I want to tell you a little bit about my introduction. <laughs> yeah. One of the amazing things about being in a quad like this is we are empowering the people to do the work of ministry. Uh, they are becoming empowered. And when they become a quad leader, uh, they take on a pastoral kind of role without even realizing it. Uh, they step into that leadership. And uh, because of the way these things are put together, almost anybody can handle this. I mean, if you can ask a group of three people, what answer did you get for question three? You can lead a group. 
Uh, it, it takes no theological training or degree to be able to do this. And almost any member of your congregation who's been a believer very long and been through one of these groups will be able to step into a leadership role like this and be able to lead a quad. And you have empowered them to do the most significant thing Jesus Christ asked us to do in the Great Commission, and that's to teach others these truths that have become so critical for us and so important to us. So um, the relational environment, uh, critical to this whole process. Great. Amen. Yeah. So what sets these apart from other aspects of church program? And how does this approach emulate the way Jesus made disciples? You might recall in that Luke passage that we looked at, it said that Jesus spent all night in prayer, and then he called 12 to be his apostles. So uh, the power of personal invitation, Jesus prayed and, and got clear from, with his father who it was he was to invite and uh, the kind of journey that was going to be ahead to see the shaping influence over their lives. And this is really what sets this approach apart from other things. Uh, when you are forming a group of three or four, it starts in prayer. You prayerfully ask the Lord to put on your heart those to whom you might be drawn to be on the journey with you in disciple making. So I love to just kind of uh, spend some time in prayer, wait till that person's heart na name is settled on my heart. And so when I go to them, I can say something like, you know, I'm, I'm forming a new group. Um, the purpose of this group is to help us uh, become uh, more fully devoted followers of Jesus and, and also to equip us to help others do the same. And as I've been praying about it, um, God just keeps putting your name on my heart. And I would wonder if you would be willing to join me and a couple of others on this journey together for the next probably year, year and a half. Uh, we're going to use this curriculum called Discipleship Essentials. It's got 25 lessons in it. I'll sit down with you and, and show you what it's all about. But would you prayerfully consider being a part of a group like this? And I oftentimes say to them, I don't want your answer now. I want you to go off and ask the Lord uh, whether you are able to do that, whether you have the time uh, set aside. So it's a personal invitation to be on this journey. How does that contrast to the way we oftentimes uh, make disciples? Well, it's a contrast between program and relationship. So let's take a look at some of that contrast here uh, briefly. So uh, in programs, let's say Bible studies or programs, uh, seminars that you offer at the church where you're uh, transferring information from scripture to a person, from subject matter to a person, and, uh, but there's really no intimacy involved with it. Uh, relationship is about intimacy, programs is about information transfer. Uh, I was a pastor of a church in, in Chicago area, a large mega church, church. And when I got there, their idea of program was to get a, put a pastor who was theologically trained up in front of a, cl group, a class and teach them for an hour on Sunday morning. It was all about information transfer. I like to think of it as the teacher has a full picture and the student has an empty picture and you're just transferring the contents of the picture from one to another. <laughs> And, uh, but there's really no personal relationship involved with that. There's no intimate connection there. The second characteristic um, of a program is it's one doing on behalf of the many. Usually there's a subject expert, and you, the subject expert is uh, giving you their information, but there's no mutual participation of the persons uh, involved there. Um, but that's the difference, and in a relationship there's mutual participation. Now, the, the paradigm uh, of this subject expert is, of course, the pastor preaching at the, at the weekend service. Pastor puts in, what, 15, 20 hours of work uh, on a message, gets up and delivers it over a half hour period, and uh, maybe some people are even taking notes, who knows, uh, on what uh, is being said. But uh, here's two uh, maybe controversial statements. Um, First one is, it's been amply demonstrated that you can't make disciples by preaching at people. <laughs> if we could have made disciples by preaching at people, that job would have been done a long time ago. And here's my second statement. That is, even the greatest preacher who ever lived, Jesus himself did not rely on his preaching to make disciples. 
Now, we are thankful for his preaching. We're thankful for the content that we have in the New Testament that we can study and apply to our own lives. But Jesus invested in a few as the means of making disciples. And so in a micro group, you have everybody, as Ralph already said, preparing for the material, coming up with their own answers to biblically based content. Uh, you're coming to share your insights with one another. You're learning from each other. There's a, a maximum participation. The third characteristic of a program versus relationship is that uh, programs are synchronized. You get 20 people in a class doing discipleship. Uh, in the class, you have to be at the same place in the same lesson. So let's say you've got 20 people going through a 10 week program. Uh, everybody's at lesson one, everybody's at lesson two, everybody's at lesson three when you come together. It's a synchronized process. Uh, it's kind of like manufacturing a car. <laughs> you have uh, all the parts that you are assembling uh, together. But what we love about microgroups is that they're customized. In other words, you are getting to know each other intimately and personally. Uh, if we could put all the faces of people on the screen here at once, we'd say, wow, gosh, everybody looks different. We probably all have different learning styles. We're at different places in terms of our own discipleship journey and what, what we need in our life. We need to be known for where we are. And that's what the value is of a th group of three or four. You can be known uh, in that group. I think of a group that I had that had a young man in his 30s, a young man in his, and another man in his 40s, one in his 50s, and, and myself uh, in my 60s at the time. And uh, the young guy uh, had just gotten married and uh, went off on his honeymoon and found out almost immediately that uh, his wife was pregnant with their first child. Uh, this 30-some guy said, gee, when I looked around and saw these older guys, I wondered, what did I have to learn from them? <laughs> and then he got married, and then he had a child. And he realized he had a lot to learn from people who had gone before him. Uh, the, the young man in, in his 40s uh, had come out of an alcoholic family. Uh, his father was a raging alcoholic who was very um, abusive to his mother and the children. And uh, Ron's big challenge was, how can I trust God as father in my life? Because I've had such a father that, frankly, I hate. Um, so he had that to overcome, and we spent a lot of time discussing that. Would he have had an opportunity to just discuss those issues uh, in a class, sitting in rows, or in, even in class going through curriculum? Probably not. Uh, and then the last thing we're trying to accomplish is life change versus content accountability. A lot of discipleship programs are focused on making sure you fill in the blanks in the workbook, maybe memorize the scripture, uh, uh, but it's all evaluating, uh, you know, completing the content of the program. That's not our goal. Our goal is not just filling in the blanks in the workbook. Our goal is life change. Where in my discipleship do I need to change my values? Uh, where do I need to confess my sin? Uh, what new pl places, um, new practices do I need to put in place to ensure a daily connection with Christ? Um, those kinds of things. That's really what we're ultimately trying to accomplish. So um, that gives you a snapshot of the microgroup uh, and perhaps its environment, how it contrasts with um, general programs in the life of a ministry or church community. Uh, so we wanted to keep it intimate, personal, uh, sharing our heart and life together. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go. So this is an opportunity again uh, for us to get into some groups. Um, Steve will break us in. And uh, can you see the difference between a relational versus program approach? Uh, what's the difference between making disciples in a relational setting versus offering classes focused on content, for example? Uh, what might be the difference between one-on-one -on -one discipling versus a group of three or four? Um, I know for me and myself, um, uh, I always thought discipling was a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Um, the Navigator's Ministry had left that imprint in my mind. That was the very definition of discipling one person inviting another to join them on that journey. 
until I stumbled into um, the groups of three or four and said, oh my gosh, this is so much more life-giving to have three or four people. I could be a pastor in a group like that and uh, be myself, be on the journey with others. I didn't have to be the focal point. It didn't create dependency. It allowed a mutuality of, of interaction. So let's talk about this together. Um, Steve is going to send us off for another five minutes, and let's see who you get paired up with this time. If everyone can click the link on your screen, go ahead and join your group. See you in five minutes. Okay. Okay, good. Tell me when we're mostly back. 47 back. 47 back, okay. Uh -huh. I, can't, I can't see that at this point. That should be everybody. Okay. Welcome back uh, from your groups. So hopefully there was a good conversation about the relational versus programmatic approach and how the the dynamics of the microgroup. Um, so we just want to remind you that we'd love to have any questions. Hopefully we've stimulated some questions at this point in time and feel free to put them in the chat box and as soon as we start seeing questions there we will pause and uh, try to pick them up as we go. So um, now I'm going to move into um, further into the relational environment that we'd like to see happen within the context uh, of the microgroup experience. So that car represents the microgroup, and uh, it's very important uh, that we uh, focus in on that. Uh, the microgroup I call creating the hothouse effect. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, hothouse, or another term for that is greenhouse. And uh, that's, of course, greenhouses or hothouses are controlled environmental conditions to make for maximum growth, right? Uh, so you can even have a hothouse in the middle of winter uh, that will continue to allow things to, to grow and develop. Uh, this image came to me one summer when my wife and I had the opportunity to travel to Alaska in the month of July. And uh, in the, those summer months, uh, you might know that since Alaska is very far north, uh, that the sun barely sets uh, from mid-May to the end of August, and you get this little sliver of darkness at midnight, but the sun just continues, and that creates a hothouse effect, and things grow very, very rapidly uh, at that time. You know, we heard stories about pumpkins that became 500 pounds in a very short period of time. Uh, zucchini squash, the length of a baseball bat, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so I thought, wow, that's really is a good image of what I've experienced uh, in the microgroup as I've watched people grow and develop in this, in this kind of times. And so uh, here is uh, what we consider the elements of the hothouse effect. When we open our hearts in transparent trust to each other around the truth of God's word in the spirit of mutual accountability engaged in our God-given mission, we are in the Holy Spirit's hothouse of transformation. Now we will only have time and our time together here to look at the first and third bullets uh, on, on your screen. Open our hearts in transparent trust to each other uh, and the spirit of mutual accountability uh, which we will talk about in terms of a covenant. So, uh, but I want to start with um, this image that you have uh, on the screen. Greg, I don't um, know if anyone else is seeing different, but I'm still seeing the... Uh, yes, we haven't moved. You haven't moved the PowerPoint. I haven't? Check your PowerPoint. All right. Okay. I'm, tell me what you see. What are you seeing? We're seeing the what guy you, from prison. Okay, yeah, that's that should be what that's where where I left off. Okay, go. For okay, it. all right. Um, sorry about that. So uh, 
you might see in the middle of these Texas prisoners, this is a prison in uh, southern Texas, um, they had the hot house of the Holy Spirit. Um, this was a mural at the, in the center of their section. These are 48 prisoners that were a part of a disciple-making ministry uh, in this Texas prison. Happened to be a maximum security prison. And the chaplain there had read my book, Transforming Discipleship, and taken this phrase and uh, had one of the artists, uh, one of the prisoners, turn this into a centerpiece uh, for their particular unit. So the Holy Spirit... Hot House of the Holy Spirit, when we open our hearts in transparent trust around the truth of God's Word, and spirit of life change accountability, we are in the Holy Spirit's hot house of transformation. Um, so, um, just love to tell this, this story. I got a letter. I, I've sent books to various prisons and been involved in prison ministry myself for quite a number of years. And uh, got a letter from one of the correctional facilities that was using the Discipleship Essentials material that I sent and uh, got a wonderful letter back uh, telling me how they were discipling others in prison. And I think you'll be inspired a little bit by these words. Uh, the writer says, it's a great temptation to believe that as society has deemed us as unfit to live among them, God has given up on us as well. The lies the enemy whispers in our ears come in the form of doubt, guilt, shame, and a lot of uselessness. Quote, God could never use someone like you. Quote, you are disqualified. Even, quote, God can never love someone like you. Thankfully, we believe that the Bible is true and the gospel is for us. Grace is amazing precisely because it saves wretches like us. I also believe in the Great Commission is for us. We knew that we carried a responsibility to make disciples, Christ-centered, reproducing disciples. Each of us would find two men who were saved, hungry, and untaught, and we would take a year of our lives and pour into them. Of course, this is where you came in, your curriculum and generosity to provide for us with books gave us a foundation to get started. I wish I could tell you that a couple of years later, every convict in this prison was walking with the Lord. Of course, that is not the case. But this month, we have started our fourth generation of discipleship. Every man went through the program and then was challenged to find two other faithful men to pass the baton of discipleship to. To see multiplication in action has been such a blessing. We are growing. And here's my favorite line in the letter. God is becoming famous here. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's just a picture of disciples in prison taking the responsibility to invest in others who invest in others who invest in others and seeing four generations of disciple making uh, take place. Um, it's just what, it, what an inspiring. So I always say, uh, if they can do it, why can't we do it? <laughs> Why can't we be committed to making this happen? So here's our value. Uh, God's word shapes us, our hearts, in honest, open, and mutually accountable relationships. So one of the key characteristics of a microgroup is we're trying to form a deep sense of transparent trust. That's the value of a group of three or four. Um, you can get to deep places of openness and honesty about those th places in your life that need God's change, needs God's touch uh, in your life to become a different person. That would be harder to do in a larger group of, say, 8 to 10. Uh, you can't really get down to that level of trust. Uh, and uh, it's not quite the same in a one-on-one -on -one relationship either. Uh, so here's the key principle. The extent to which we are willing to reveal to others those areas of our life that need God's transforming touch is the extent to which we are inviting the Holy Spirit to make us new. In other words, if I'm really serious about wanting Christ to make me into a new person, I will have people in my life uh, that I can be open with and honest with to say, you know, uh, this is an area of my life that I'm not happy with, I'm ashamed of actually, but I need you to know this is where I need God to work in my life. Uh, I need to be open about that with you 
uh, because I'm so serious about what I want God to do to change me to become a person. So on the horizontal level, our relationship with others, we are open and honest because we want our vertical relationship with God to be clear, open uh, with uh, before him as well. So there's some stages that you go through to develop this trust, and we'll kind of look at these um, very quickly. So first of all, affirmation. Um, the whole idea is that uh, we will build each other up in love. I, I love this quote from Gordon McDonald's book on um, restoring your spiritual passion. He says, one solid and loving rebuke is worth a hundred affirmations. And I like to say, uh, I like to turn that around. One, uh, what you need one solid and loving rebuke for every hundred affirmations. I can, I can receive a rebuke if I'm being affirmed uh, by others, and uh, I'm having encouragement. When we're starting groups, uh, we're pretty aware that there's probably some anxiety with three or four people that are coming together that may not know each other all that well. And you know, well, I like these people. Do I really want to open my life to them? Gee, spending a year to a year and a half together, that's a long time. Uh, you know, and so there's going to be some nervousness about that. So I always like to start with kind of highly relational times, getting to know each other's stories. We always tell our faith journey. Uh, when have you been closest to God in your life? When have you, have you been furthest away from God uh, in your life? Who have been the significant people that have shaped our, our stories? Um, even tell some fun stories if you're married, how did you meet your spouse? Um, you know, those kinds of things that uh, would be fun to hear. But we need encouragement at the beginning. And uh, I tell the story of my encounter with Chris. Uh, Chris um, was our worship leader at our church um, years back and always did a wonderful job of, of pointing us to Christ and losing himself and not drawing attention to himself. And one morning I was went into the restroom prior to going to worship. I was standing there next to Chris uh, as we were washing our hands. And uh, I said, oh, I said to myself, Chris, um, I, I, I never get a chance to tell you how much I appreciate you. And I just said to him, you know, God has given you a gift to lead us in worship. And thank you so much for using that gift on our behalf. And it was his response that shocked me. He said, Thank you so much. I hardly ever hear that. Uh, he wasn't getting affirmation. He wasn't hearing the affirmation. And it just reminded me that we just need to be generous uh, with our affirmation of others and start our groups in, in that fashion. Uh, then you have a chance to walk with each other during difficult times. Uh, when you're together for a year, a year and a half, Believe me, somebody, or more than somebody, will have some times of, of difficulty. Uh, it could be a loss of a job. could be, uh, a, if you're a parent, having a child that's gone off the rails. Um, you know, it could be an illness. Uh, it could be a loss of somebody that you love dearly. That kind of thing. So if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all is honored together. Rob, let me tell, turn to you and uh, have you tell Ed's story. Well, I had a, a quad that was meeting in an outdoor restaurant, and uh, there were four of us there. And uh, one uh, lunch that we showed up together to, to meet for our study, uh, Ed just kind of opened the, the time saying, oh, by the way, uh, I'm looking for an apartment. I don't think uh, Pammy and I are going to make it. Well, what he was saying was that he's, his marriage was falling apart. Uh, well, at that point, we close our books and we say, OK, <laughs> let's talk about this. And for the next three weeks, we spent the entire time uh, counseling Ed. Now, I wasn't I was a pastor, but the, the other th two guys in the group were jumping right in and uh, walked Ed through this very difficult time in his life. Uh, we put the book aside. We put the material aside because the personal individual uh challenges that people face are critical and we need to deal with those. And that's what a discipleship is really all about. It's not just going through curriculum. It's dealing with life stuff. Uh, 
Uh, last Sunday, I was in Camarillo. We had a joint service and all the services came together and they filled the auditorium and they started passing the microphone around to people in the audience to maybe comment on uh, the ministry that my wife or myself had had in their life. And, uh, and the sitting on the front row was Ed and his wife, Pam. And they, he was the first one to stand up and ju jump up and take the microphone. He said, I just want you to know that I would not be here in this auditorium this afternoon if it had not been for uh, the participation in uh, the micro group that Ralph was leading. Uh, Pammy and I would not be together anymore. And it saved his marriage. And that was not the only time we saw that happen. We saw that happen many times in our uh, church in Southern California, where we had a lot of military families, and some of these dads were gone on long military assignments, and families fall apart during those times. And there were a lot of marriages that were saved in these quads uh, that were meeting because we dealt with each other's stuff. Amen. So I, I could regale you with a story after story of walking with others in difficult times. I would simply say it's a privilege. Uh, when you are able to be alongside people who are going through tough stuff um, and being the heart of Jesus uh, to them, uh, that it really is an honor to do that. I've been both on the receiving end of that as well as on the giving end of that as well during these times. The third stage is, and this is probably one of the most important, is being reflective listeners, listening deeply uh, to each other's stories. Um, Boy, I just can't stress this enough. Um, we are, I think, not very good listeners. <laughs> uh, when I think of what makes for a good listener and who are the people in our lives that we would say are really good listeners, what characteristics come to your mind? What makes for a good listener? Well, I think of certain people in my life and they, they stay with your story. They ask questions and follow up. Uh, they make sure that they get to the nub of what you wanted to say, that, that you are heard and understood. They are repeating back to you what they are hearing you say. And they're not quickly moving on to some other topic or other situation. They stay with you. Uh, and sometimes that leads to birthing a whole new direction in somebody's life. Uh, this was true of Dave in our group. Dave was in his early 50s, had been in the insurance business for 30-some years, and he was sensing that God had something more for him at this stage of life than uh, what uh, he was experiencing. And he would share with us uh, his um, searching out an organization called C12, which was helping Christian CEOs run their businesses in a way that was honoring to God. Now, he would have to leave his insurance business, take up a new for-profit business uh, to do this, leave the safety net of financial security, and uh, to take on this mission of helping Christian businessmen uh, be faithful to Christ as they led their own companies. And this of course, unfolded over a period of time as Dave would come back with further questions and quest wondering about whether this is what God would have for him or not, um, how does his wife feel about it, all of those things. And it was a joy to see Dave make that move of turning away from his lucrative financial investments to take on this whole new uh, mission. And uh, we got to be a part of that birth process as we listened uh, to, to Dave. And that can happen um, in different situations. And then finally, uh, the deep end of the pool, I call it, is getting to the point of where we can confess our besetting sins. Those things in our life, and we all know what they are, I can see my own, even as I talk about it, that have been the things uh, in my own character, in my own heart, in my own thought processes that have, that have messed me up and uh, need to get to the place where I can share those with others and unload them uh, on other people uh, so that we can be confessors to one another. Uh, in the Protestant tradition, I think we talk, call this the priesthood of all believers. Uh, to each one of us is a priest. Um, I'm a priest before God. 
Uh, we don't go to a human mediator as you would in the Catholic Church. We have one mediator between God and man, that's Christ Jesus. But we get to be each other's priests. I confess my sin to you, you confess your sin to me. And then I get a chance to say, um, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ, I want you to know you are forgiven. Wow. To be on the receiving end of that and to be on the giving end of that is what. So James tells us to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. Greg, let me jump in here for a minute if I can. Please. <clears throat> Answering one of the questions that, that came up in the chat room, uh, why, why four and not 12? Uh, basically, uh, when you're in a group of four, you can be that honest. You can be that transparent. When you're in a group of 12, it's not as nearly as likely. And also the question, you know, are these, is gender specificity necessary? Guys with guys and girls with girls, gals with gals, absolutely necessary to see the kind of transformation that we're looking for. You won't see that in a group, in a mixed group. You cannot be that honest in a mixed group. You can't talk about the things you need to talk about in a mixed group or large group. That's one of the geniuses, uh, I think, of the group of four as compo compared to a larger group or a group of guys and gals mixed together. And, and, the, and, and the idea of a closed group, too, I think that was one of the questions that came up, too. These, yeah, is it always the same four people? Yeah. Once you start the group, it's a closed group. It's the same four people every week for a year, year and a half to finish the curriculum. And that's what builds that level of trust and transparency that's so critical for transformation. Yeah, and I see another question there about student ministry, because uh, I realized that something like Discipleship Essentials with its 25 lessons, which you cannot cover in 25 weeks, uh, will take you beyond a year-long commitment. And, uh, you know, can you use some other material uh, that's not quite as long as that or a portion of the material um, in that way? Certainly you can uh, adapt that. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, Zeph and Samuel will, will translate a smaller book that I have uh, called Essential Guide to Becoming a Disciple, which is only eight lessons on the Great Commission. And it was designed for that very reason to get people into a discipleship process um, so that uh, you could uh, you know, get people going, um, but it's not so overwhelming. I realize that Disciples of Essentials can be overwhelming in its, in, in its length uh, for some people. It's hard for people to sustain a longer-term relationship. But the, um, the book, Craig, is, is broken. You broke it into four parts. Right, that's true. And you yeah, took a part at a time. Exactly, yeah. So there's four sections uh, that answer really different questions and emphasize different things. Uh, in that material. So you could, if you wanted to concentrate more on the doctrinal portion of it, you can do the second section. If you're trying to concentrate on the transformational portion, that's the third section in terms of what Christ wants to do in us. If you're trying to focus on the mission portion of it. That's the last section on how does Christ want to use us. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can emphasize different aspects of it uh, because it does very much focus on, on that, different things. Okay. Um, we haven't mentioned see. the curriculum yet, Greg, and I think that's a critical thing. Did you want to go to that? We could and go directly to that. Let's, um, let's, let's make sure we wrap up a little bit on, on this particular element here of why um, the transparency is so important. Hopefully that's understood. I don't, we don't, maybe don't need to break into groups. I know we're kind of getting close to on the time thing. Okay, um, so just to emphasize that the reason, a major reason for the size, the smaller size is the level of trust and how important it is to be able to apply the word of God to right where we live. My beef about Bible studies is that we tend to be very information oriented in Bible studies, not transformation oriented. And uh, this is all about transforming, being transformed into the likeness of Christ. That's, the, that's where we're going with that. Okay, uh, we can jump ahead um, to, to the um, section on curriculum and uh, take a look at that um, and pick up on, uh, on that. So um, the, this kind of relates back to where are we in our process here. 
we're jumping over leadership at this point and uh, going directly to, to the reproducible process of curriculum. So remember the three elements, uh, microgroup, the relational environment, intentional leader, which is really a facilitator uh, of the conversation. Uh, and uh, we've tried to make the leadership role very easy to do. And then finally, the content that you put into the context uh, is the discipleship curriculum. Uh, and discipleship essentials, which we'll look at in a, in a moment. Okay, so uh, I look at the puzzle pieces there um, and uh, trying to put the pieces together of what the Christian life is, is all about. Um, one of the questions I noticed um, as I looked through it was, uh, when, when is it, what, what does it mean to be a disciple? Um, and maybe the best question is, what are we trying to accomplish at this phase of disciple making because the material that I put together is meant to be foundational. Uh, it's not meant to cover every aspect of the Christian life just because you've gone through disciples of essentials. Um, you know, it's not an end all and be all by any means. Uh, it's, it's laying a solid foundation. It's putting the building blocks together. So what happens if you do not have a curriculum? What's the consequences if you don't have a curriculum? Well, first of all, if you don't have a curriculum, you don't have a plan. You do not have a plan as to where you're trying to take people. Uh, what are you trying to accomplish uh, with people? And that's why I, I like the image of puzzle pieces, because I think we have a lot of disconnected puzzle pieces in our Christian life. You know, it's, we've been accumulating puzzle pieces, but not assembling them into a coherent picture of what the Christian life is all about. And so I kind of visualize, okay, you hear a good sermon, oh, that's a puzzle piece, throw it in a box. Uh, read a passage of scripture, oh, i got to remember that, throw that puzzle piece in a box. Um, somebody s gives you an insight about your life in Christ, <clears throat> throw that puzzle piece in a box. Uh, all you have is a bunch of disconnected puzzle pieces. <laughs> and, uh, what a good curriculum does, hopefully, uh, is uh, put this plan together so you hear, see some coherent picture of what the Christian life is all about and gives you a plan to take people through foundations. So um, the discipleship of essentials is, is foundation laying. It's not meant to deal with every issue, of, obviously, in terms of the Christian life. Um, that's much more complex, but it gets you consider it as building blocks to a foundation. Second thing is, uh, without a curriculum, you will not be intentional. Uh, where are you taking somebody? Um, uh, intentional is opposed to being haphazard or without a sense of, of direction. And so the whole idea of intentionality, of where are you going uh, in the relationship is important. Uh, thirdly, it, without a curriculum, you don't have a transferable tool. Now, this is a very important point. Uh, how are you going to disciple somebody else? We, let's go back to the very initial challenge we gave you at the start of our time together, and that was you have the assignment of taking somebody under your wing and, and bringing them along in terms of your faith. Maybe one of the things you would have said was, hmm, do you have a tool? Do you have a guide? Do you have a, a curriculum that I can use uh, to do that? And the value of going through this yourself is then then you have acquired a tool that you can now use with others and uh, to help that, uh, that come along. Uh, I like to tell the story of uh, a man by the name of Mick. Uh, Mick was a lifelong Roman Catholic, came to our Protestant church in Chicago. He was a part of our uh, new members class. And when he walked into that class, he handed me a notebook and it was 97 single spaced typed pages comparing Roman Catholic theology to Protestant theology. And he had to have a satisfied mind because he had been a Roman Catholic all his life and his, his Protestant wife was saying, we want to go to a Protestant church. And uh, he said, mm, not so sure about that. Uh, I better look into this. And so he did his homework. I thought, oh, this guy is serious about uh, his work. And so I was just starting a new group at that time, so I invited him to join it. Um, and we were meeting in a law office uh, of one of our group members. And the very, very first day, he shows up, and he's got his very thick study Bible with all the Bible book tabs on it. And he put his, puts his hand on the Bible as if 
Uh, you know, in, in American courts, we put our hands on the Bible and we say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, and um, he, he was put his hand on the Bible and he said, you know, I have never opened a Bible. And I, I remember exactly what I said back to him. You mean you've never read it seriously? No, I have never opened a Bible. He did all that study on the difference between Roman Catholic and Protestant theology out of a book, but not the Bible. And uh, he sat there in mass and in Roman Catholic churches for years and years and years, never opened the Bible. Uh, you know, listen to the scriptures read, certainly, but, uh, well, I, was, I thought, wow, we're going to have a journey ahead here. And, uh, but Nick, being true to himself, he dove in and uh, started working on memorizing the scriptures, and he had all kinds of questions. We just went down rabbit trail after rabbit trail uh, from the questions that, that he asked. But 20 months later, he started his own group. He had a tool, and he was smart enough to know what he didn't know. <laughs> and if he didn't have answers um, with the other guys in the group, he just made a list. Every once in a while, he invited me into their group. Okay, we've accumulated 15 questions. Um, come on in and help us answer these questions. <laughs> and so uh, we, we did, and it was just wonderful to see. Um, without a curriculum, you'll not have a sense of progression. What's the progress? Uh, they were making. How do you know you're making uh, any progress anywhere? Uh, one of the reasons for writing Dis Discipleship Essentials for me was uh, I would be meeting with men one on one and I was just cobbling material together. Oh, we need to study basic Christianity, so use that book. We need to do some quiet time material. Okay, let's do that. Um, and I, I didn't have any one place where I could go to have it be a cohesive whole and a sense of progression. So that's Motive, what motivated one of the things that motivated me to write Discipleship Essentials. And then finally, uh, without a curriculum, you won't have a structure to define your time together. The curriculum gives you what I like to say uh, tracks to run on. Uh, they, are the, they are the structure for your time. And even if you depart from uh, the curriculum for a period of time, like I'm sure Ralph did with Ed and his dealing with uh, his marriage situation, you always had something to come back to, tracks to run on, to continue on uh, a particular direction. Uh, and so that the groups did not deteriorate into just you know, mutual chit chat. You, have, you had territory to cover. So I'll skip through that. So there's Discipleship Essentials uh, in English, and there's Discipleship Essentials in Serbian, there's Discipleship Essentials in Albanian. Um, and I think we have at least one that I know of is in process in Macedonian um, and uh, maybe others in the Balkan region, I don't know, um, but that's the only one other than I know. So you can see the description um, there uh, of that material. Okay, um, the, my basic textbook, for those of you who are English readers, um, this is a book in companionship with Discipleship Essentials. Uh, it describes the need for disciple making in the church today, the model that Jesus and Paul used to grow disciples, and then how we, we can take that model and transfer it into the local church setting uh, for a strategy of relationship multiplication and transformation into a disciple making network. So, uh, Samuel and Zeph, you better get on with it. Uh, you got work to do. <laughs> uh, and then this is the little book I was referring to earlier, the eight lesson book, Essential Guide to Becoming a Disciple. Um, for those of you who don't have, uh, who want to do something that's a shorter on-ramp experience, this is what I call it, the on-ramp to the discipleship process. And it's Sorry eight to lessons interrupt, on. Greg, you seem to be referring yeah. to PowerPoint again, but it's not moving. We're not seeing your PowerPoints, Greg. Really? What's going on here? Is that moving? Nope. Okay, what am I doing here? Here's the smaller eight eight lesson book, and this is the transfer okay. discipleship that he was meet, meaning is his basic text for. Well, and it's, always and it's, let me know ahead. Let me know sooner than than that. <laughs> okay, let me let me pull it back up and see if what's on the screen now. 
Well, you were going to offer to everyone a, a copy of your outline. Is that correct, Greg? I'll, I'll give everyone a copy of this PowerPoint. Co copy of the PowerPoint. So if someone, yeah. if you didn't get some of that material that Greg was just talking about, it was on a PowerPoint and it didn't get displayed for whatever reason, uh, we can send you a copy of this uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, or, or this this. Uh, slides from it, and uh, you can you can get all that information. Okay, what are we seeing on the screen now? Now we're seeing your different uh, translations. Okay, yeah, seeing multiple. Uh, quick multiple, question, multiple. Then, Ralph, you made a comment about offering a copy of this PowerPoint. How should people contact you? Uh, GDI Global Discipleship Initiative. That's our website. Or if, if you just want to supply me, uh, supply us with the emails from people, they can let you know and we can uh, go that direction. Yeah, you can request it uh, through your local contacts or you can go to our website online, globaldiscipleship.com and ask for it there. Okay, and you can see the, uh, I assume, can you see the, yes, the uh, table of contents? Table right. con all right, I don't know what happens there. Yeah, so you can see the four sections that Ralph was referring to earlier uh, for the, those who would want to kind of take a portion at a time. Uh, you can see the, the different topics there, growing up in Christ and quiet time Bible study prayer worship, but sets the scene with making disciples and being a disciple is the first two lessons. Uh, this is the doctrinal section. Uh, it answers the question, what has Christ done for us? and uh, rooted in the triune God, made in the image of God, etc. cetera. Um, the third section, becoming like Christ, is what does Christ want to do in us? How, how does he want to change us from the inside out? And that's where the work of the Holy Spirit uh, comes in and the qualities of trust and love, justice and witness um, are a part of that transformation process. And then finally, the last section of the book answers the question, what does Christ want to do through us? Um, that's where the doctrine of the church and minister gifts, spiritual warfare, walking in obedience, and then sharing the wealth. Um, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful ones who can teach others also as well. So, um, and then there's a bonus chapter on, on money. Someone asked a question about working with high school students, and I, my comment there is that high school students, some would be able to handle this curriculum, others might not. You might have to, uh, to, to bring it down to a level where they could uh, or take it in pieces, smaller pieces, so that high school kids could do it. It's primarily, I think, I, I would say targeted at a college level uh, curriculum. Greg, would you agree with that? And um, yeah, or you know, latter, latter uh, some high school students like juniors and seniors could certainly tackle it. They have right, uh, maybe a short, or shortened version. Yeah, so. it's, it's really Bible College One Hundred and One. I love to call it. It's it covers all the basic essentials that you're going to get in your first year of Bible College. Okay. Well, maybe we should try to. Is you no, know, if there are no further questions, um, we should try to bring it to a close here. Uh, so just to summarize um, what we have uh, covered and as much as we could, um, this whole process is fundamentally relational. Disciples are made in relationships. Uh, if people are not involved in a highly relational setting, um, then my guess is that they're not going to have the opportunity to go through a transformative process. So we follow, try to follow Jesus' model. He shows us that uh, you make relation, disciples in relationship uh, in order to develop trust and transparency. Uh, with the microgroups, uh, the value of what we do is that leadership is accessible to the vast majority of Christ followers. If you've gone through a group experience, you will have practiced leadership over and over again because we, we simply say, you know, rotate leadership within your group settings. You learn to lead by doing it. Uh, there's no separate training program for leaders within a microgroup experience. It's just simply that um, uh, you can guide people through the content, uh, and almost anybody can do that. Um, and so you're just a, a guide asking questions and, and moving things along in that fashion. 
Uh, the group setting keeps it simple because you're just having a conversation. And then finally, the GPS, uh, the curriculum, provides the transferable tool and empowers the disciples uh, to, to do others, do so. So we're, we uh, commend you uh, for this, uh, that you will experiment. And, and uh, so the challenge might be, uh, who are the three people? that God might put on your heart to go and invite to join you on this journey, if this is something new. Um, a way to implement it is to be able to, be, to quickly um, think about asking God to put people on your heart. Maybe some people have even come to your mind as we have been, been talking through this presentation. So we want to pass the baton from one generation to the next. Um, so to be able to, to do that. So, in fact, let me show you a baton pass. One of the... Mm -hmm. Trying to... Here's a group of three men. They finished their discipleship group. They were given a baton, and now they are to complete the race uh, by passing it on to their own group as well. So think of that as a visual image of what you can do here at the end. Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, Zeph, I think we have perhaps come to the conclusion at this time. Yes, we have indeed. I would like to thank you, Greg and Ralph and DDI for um, this webinar. I'm so grateful to EOS Serbia and Basakasha Albania and all the friends. Uh, I've seen many church leaders and pastors from the Balkans who have been part of this webinar, mostly from Serbia and Albania, but also from other countries. Thank you to everybody. And I'll just close in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this time that we've had together. I pray that what we have heard will be with us, will reflect upon it, will act upon it, will be listening to your voice, will be doing your will. And we know, as we have heard, that the greatest commandment you've given us is go and make disciples. Father, help us in this process of making disciples who will make disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Again, to remind you, the book is in Serbian and in Albanian. Contact Samuel for the book in Serbian. Contact myself for the book in Albanian. Contact GDI for the um, presentation that we have just uh, heard. And... Of course, you can also get Discipleship Essentials um, by purchasing it online in English. May God bless you. And Steve, you want to say goodbye or you want to just close? Thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you especially to Greg and Ralph for taking your time to join us and lead us through this. Uh, we look forward to connecting with everyone who's on this call again in the future. Amen. Thank you so much for being with you. I hope to see you again in person.